tonight's a little bit different and the format will be a little bit different and, and Sarah will kind of lead the way and, and asking questions and that kind of thing. But I do have a lot of slides to go through and show you um, because, uh, well, because I can, right? Because you, you have to, when you're talking about stained glass and art, you got to have some slides. So uh, we'll try to show um, as many of the slides as we can. Um, but really it's, um, uh, you know, Sarah kind of um, asking questions and I'd like any of you, if you have any questions as we're going through to, to go ahead and, and, and uh, put them in the chat or whatever. So, uh, you know, Sarah can either direct them to me or if we don't get to those or, uh, you know, if it's, it's a question we can address kind of at the end. So, um, but, um, you know, the beginnings, I think what's, what's interesting about that question, Sarah, is that, um, you know, it is kind of a, a strange or unique scenario to be a fifth generation of anything, right? So, so running a stained glass firm um, that is rooted in this kind of really heavy tradition um, is kind of a blessing and a curse, right? <laughs> it's like, it's great because you have this great foundation to build on, but um, at the same time, you're kind of like steeped in this uh, tradition with these, you know, uh, forefathers looking over your shoulder in a sense. And so, um, writing the book has been really kind of a process of, of working through that for myself, you know, looking to the past and seeing the decisions that were made and seeing the influences that were on the company that, you know, saw it develop over the years. Um, and obviously they did something right to make it last 123 now years. So, um, and, and also being, you know, rooted into this kind of idea of, of the 19th century and a lot of Ruskinian ideas and that kind of thing. So, um, so I like to show this picture because that's kind of some of the concept that, that I'm talking about, right? Like on the right is, is, a, uh, is a window that uh, Judson did in 2010. And on the left is another window of the same topic, right? This idea or concept of the Lamb of God, you know, these religious imagery. Um, ours is a very traditional window on the right and on the left, a very um, contemporary um, image. And uh, that was made in Germany. And I kind of weave this concept of... Uh, Germany through a lot of the answers that that I have because um, it goes back to the beginning right and in, in, in the resurgence of stained glass and stained glass coming around in, in the 19th century um, really um, happened in, in Germany France and England but really it's um, has a lot of influence still today on on what we're doing and and is still um, something that I will get into our talk talk more about but um, uh, this is the guy who started it all this is William Lees, he's my great great grandfather. And um, he was a plein air painter. Um, but interestingly enough, he was born in England in 1842, just outside of Manchester, um, uh, close to a town called Ashton Underline. And so I, I kind of think that our arts and crafts and our Ruskinian kind of roots go back to this concept of being in the, you know, industrial, the heart of the industrial revolution, right? In, in Manchester, if you can imagine the 19th century. And um, so uh, he, in that town, you know, he's, his family saw, you know, the, the, in, the industry, the weaving industry, which is, right, so prevalent in Manchester, turns into something like that, into this, right? And this idea of, of kind of the industrialization of a, of a town and the kind of the, the weight that I think that had on on society and, and even their family, specifically the Judson family, who his father was, ended up being a manager of one of these mills and got in between uh, labor and, and management and, uh, and ownership. And, and um, you know, I think uh, supposedly the, the mill was burnt down and he said, okay, that's it, I'm gone, I, I'm leaving. And that's how he ended up coming to the United States. So he came in 1852, or Judson, uh, William Lees came when he was 10 years old in 1852 and settled in Brooklyn to farm, if you can imagine farming in Brooklyn. <laughs> it is hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and then they went to Canada because uh, supposedly the government was giving land to those who would work it, right, in the Commonwealth. And so because being English citizens, they were able to get some land in Canada and they ended up farming not, not too far from um, London, Ontario, which is near That's Toronto. Awesome. Yeah. And um, so uh, Judson was, um, grew up in England and then uh, got itchy feet and found himself in Illinois 
at the beginning of the Civil War. And he joined the Civil War and um, marched with Grant, actually. You know, Grant was from Illinois. He was in uh, Grant's regiment until they ended up in um, Tennessee. And then I think Grant went to D.C. at that time. Wow. But he survived the war, obviously, and, and uh, was given this medal by Grant's widow, actually. Um, but really, he, was, he, was, he loved painting and loved art. And this is, um, and you can see the date on that. That's 1870. And um, he was classically trained. He, he studied in um, Paris um, and uh, traveled quite a bit to see world fairs, to see great paintings and that kind of thing. And so um, his style kind of evolves over the, over the years. This is another painting that he did in Canada. This is in the London Museum of, uh, in Canada. Did he exhibit and his work at all, David? He did, yeah. He he exhibited his work. Um, he had a he had a few galleries like uh, in Toronto and New York, and he even sold down in like St. Louis and that kind of thing. So he was kind of okay. trying he was to sell. An established artist, yeah. He was, but he struggled. I mean, he was he was making ends meet, and and um, you know his um, his wife died of complications of their sixth child after their sixth child, and so he was left with six children to try and wow. raise, mm -hmm. and. Um, so he struggled and um, but that's a good question because that, that answers the why stained glass, right? To, to go from yeah. painting into stained glass. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, I'm painting paintings, but really we should maybe think about, you know, with getting his son started in stained glass and then that's what I'll, I'll get into. But um, I showed this image, this is a Paul Peel painting. He was also a professor. And so that was another important aspect of, of Judson's life and, and, and significant when he comes to LA. Um, Paul Peel ended up being, and it is still one of the best known painters in Canada. And um, his name's bigger than Judson's name, but Judson was really the, the one who kind of brought him uh, into the um, four and they traveled together. They went to the um, 1876 uh, Philadelphia World's Fair together. And um, so that, that was pretty, um, pretty significant as well. Yeah. Um, this is a painting of uh, the professor of his professor in in France. So that's uh, uh, Lefebvre's um, professor. He spent some time in the in the Louvre. This is a, a Rembrandt um, painting that he copied. And then he, you know, was always traveling and and ended up in Chicago. And again, I think this is another important um, aspect of. Um, you know, maybe where stained glass came in and maybe, um, you know, this, this kind of sense of the arts and crafts movement and the architecture that was going on um, in the 1890s in Chicago. Um, this is the auditorium building, um, Louis uh, uh, Sullivan. And um, Judson actually, when he first moved to Chicago, had a studio in this building. Mm. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright would have been working in the building at the time. So yeah, I always kind of wonder if they ran into each other in the <laughs> a lot of interesting elevator. connections that would bear fruit later there. Um. Yeah, exactly. Um, he was involved with the art. This is the arts building in the World's Fair. He was involved with that to a certain extent. I think that was pretty important. He showed his work in Chicago during that time. Um, but just a massive fair. Um, he was in Chicago from 1890 to 93. It was basically told to find a, a warm place to die. And that's where California comes into play. So, um, and this is a letter, I love to read this letter, if I can read just this one line of a letter that he wrote um, to his daughter. Um, and this is dated December 13th, 1893. So you can imagine, imagine leaving Chicago and coming to, to Los Angeles in December, right? <laughs> having, having lived up there for, for so many years and he says, my dear Bertha, this is the beginning of the realization of the dream of my life. If you were all here in a house of my own with a modest income, I think I should be entirely happy. I have found a country where I could settle down without any desire or expectation to move again. And so I think that's a pretty, um, you know, solid statement in the fact that it's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not moving again. This is it. And this is where he settled. This is the Arroyo Seco. Um, and so this is um, looking north. That's the, what's, if, for those of you in Pasadena, the Holly Street Bridge. So that's the Holly Street Bridge. It's, it's a different bridge now. Um, this would have been um, probably early teens, this painting. And probably over that hill on the right-hand side is the Rose Bowl. And how old was he around this time? I just wanted to just catch us up around the time. Yeah, so if he, if he was, um, this is 93. So he's about 50, a little over 50. Okay. Yeah. 
And he'd done a lot already. Yeah, he'd done a lot. I mean, he was he was one of those guys who did everything. He didn't yeah. he didn't rest much. Um, but yeah, always moving, always painting. Very prolific painter. Um, being a portrait painter, which I showed you, but really becoming more of a, a plain air painter. What you know, mm -hmm. I guess we'd call plain air painting now. One of the early yeah. plain air painters. This is the Arroyo as well. This is probably looking kind of northwest. And then the Arroyo was filled of all these footbridges. So, um, you know, he spent a lot of time there. This, this was his house on the left there, you see. Okay. And um, so this is looking kind of northwest as well. Um, um, before now, unfortunately, that dry riverbed is the 110 freeway. Mm. Right? <laughs> but it was a, you know, an LA Times article that said that he, he um, spent a lot of time in that, you know, that tower. You see the tower up there. There was a... The LA Times wrote, said there was an easel and a cot. And so, uh, you know, being a plein air painter, what's the most important thing? It's the light, right? Yeah. And um, again, another connection with this idea of stained glass and the study of light. And um, so he wanted to capture sunrise and sunset. And so he kind of set himself up on, on in theory, like literally the other side of the tracks. He, he couldn't afford to live in Pasadena so um, that house is in Garvanza, um, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so he um, um, settled in there. And, and as, you, as the letter states, he's like, I'm not moving. This is it, you know, and yeah. sent for his family. But you you know, spent a lot see... of time sketching. Oh, yeah, go ahead, sir. No, I was just gonna say, you can also see how he may not have known it even at the time, but all the things he was doing and the steps he was taking were, um, were preparing him. Um, for stained glass. I mean, he, he was gathering all the information and the skills and the, even just the vision that he needed um, to be able to do that. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. We have his, um, his um, log book, I guess you'd call it, from the 1870s when he was in Canada, right after coming back from the Civil War. And he did everything. I mean, he, he painted signs, he yeah. painted portraits. He, you know, he did stained glass a little bit. He, you know, he did a little bit of everything to, to kind of, so he wasn't just a painter. I mean, he was a craftsman as well and, um, you know, worked with his hands. And I think that that philosophy kind of stuck, stuck with him. And I think that's why, you know, I like to talk about this idea of coming from, you know, uh, the heart of England to, you know, you know, working his way west, you mm -hmm. know, and the influence that had on, on so many people during that time. And, and, um, you know, we've heard Bill Devereaux talk about, you know, people coming out here after the Civil War, right, to, 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 to basically kind of restart and, and start anew. And, and Judson was definitely one of those people. Um, you know, I, these are just some of his sketches. We have a number of his sketches, you know, that he would have done um, while traveling. The one on the left looks like the Sierras. It's probably the Sierras. The one on the right is Laguna. He spent a lot of time down in Laguna, like a lot of the early planar painters. Um, and, you know, again, it, I think it was just this idyllic place, right? And, um, and then he, you know, again, to make ends meet, started teaching. And um, so this is from the uh, USC's El Rodeo from 1899. You see him on the right-hand side there. It's before he got gray hair. I guess teaching gives you gray hair. Is that true? Is I'm working on that. <laughs> I'm working on it. Ruth. I mean, not always. <laughs> but I think this is amazing. You know, this, this picture, you know, like, wow, this is, okay, this is the painting class. And, um, and you'll notice Look it's- how many women are in the class. Basically it's really all women, you know, yeah. all women. And they're dressed for it, right? I guess yeah. that's the <laughs> casual painting. Yeah, you see these pictures and you think of how uncomfortable it must have been, but- but yeah. more comfortable than normal clothes. That's true. <laughs> so he, he built um, this building. So um, this is the original School of Fine Arts. And, and so you can imagine this was 1900. So this would have been a year after that picture you just saw. Um, but pretty amazing architecturally, if you think about the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, and I think I attribute it to his time probably in Chicago and seeing the architecture in Chicago. Mm -hmm. you know, this feels very kind of Viennese secessionist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this was right behind his house. So that picture that I showed you with the, with the tower of his house, this is okay. across the street in Garwanza. And so, you know, I don't know exactly, you know, uh, how um, the relationship was with USC, but I always, again, attribute to the fact that 
he had the experience was one of the few in the city of Los Angeles. And I go into this into the book a little bit. Um, one of the few to have teaching experience on the university level. And secondly, he was a Methodist, right? So the USC yeah. were the fighting Methodists at the time. Oh. So, um, so he fit the bill on my, my theory is that they funded him to build the building while he, you know, gathered up faculty and put together the curricula and that kind of thing was, was probably best, best guess. I was going to ask you about that, about the funding of, of the college and how, how he managed that, but that you anticipated. Yeah. And USC, you know, still today, back then was, you know, the mucky mucks of town were, you know, could finance something like that. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, this, uh, really this area was this, the heart of the arts, um, district, right? It was in between Pasadena and Los Angeles. And, um, you know, the, the property was easily had, you could get to Los Angeles and Pasadena on the red car fairly easily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the both of these pictures are taken from where the red car and you see on that postcard on the bottom right, a very bottom right corner, you might see the track there a little bit of the red car, which ran right next to the building. And so people could hop on and off right there. And head up to Pasadena. And I think the red car went down all the way to Long Beach, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, he was a painter, a professor. Um, he was a preservationist. This is um, uh, called Mission Talk or Mission Gossip, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, his neighbor, one of his neighbors was Lummis, right, who was uh, mm -hmm. saving the missions at that time. And so, um, this is kind of this idyllic, again, this idyllic period that they were capturing through their work. And, um, uh, you know, to preserve and kind of capture this feeling of the missions, um, they, they kind of promoted this idea of preservation. And so that was, again, a, a very Ruskinian topic as well, right? Yeah, I was going to ask you, at what point in his life did he, was he first introduced to, the, to Ruskin's work? Because I know Ruskin was an influence, um, you know, William Morris, Burne Jones. When did he first encounter their work? I don't know. It's a very good question. I'm, I'm sure his father was a Ruskinian, you know. So if he's born in 1842, right, when's uh, Ruskin born? He's 18... 1819. 19, so... And Modern Painters comes out 1843, so... Yeah. And so, um, so I, I think that there's a connection pretty early on because his father was uh, supposedly a decorator as well. And so involved okay. creatively and in, in, in professionally. And so, um, so I think there was probably a pretty early um, connection there um, with exposure to his work. Yeah. Uh, this, this is on the um, Colorado river when it uh, um, flooded and created the Salton sea. And so this is his buddy, George Wharton James. And um, you know, if there's any LA historians, uh, George Wharton James was kind of like a Lummis character. Uh, he was a publisher, an editor. Um, he was a Methodist minister. Apparently he lost his position somehow. I'm not sure. Apparently he had a lot of nieces. He called these nieces that he traveled with. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe but, that's how he uh, lost his position. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So. Um, but anyway, I, I love this picture. You know, I love thinking about them taking this trip, you know, like just, hey, let's, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Let's go see what's going on. And, um, you know, Judson's drawing and George Wharton James, you can see he just has this massive personality and, and um, <laughs> it, they must have had a, a lot of fun. This is a picture from that trip as well. Um, and this is, um, you know, the, George Wharton James wrote an article on a publication at the time said how, how bad Judson, what a bad travel companion Judson was because he never helped set up camp, you know, because they'd go down the road, they, the, the river and they'd, they'd land and he wanted to paint immediately. And so everyone was setting up camp while he was painting. And, um, but yeah, to, to, it's, it's kind of fun to think about. And then George Wharton James and Judson created the Royal Guild. And so, this is really where we see this kind of uh, uh, Ruskinian arts and crafts philosophy um, coming to bear. And, um, you know, it really was um, built on those, you know, on those philosophies. And, you know, but I, but I think this was a very California version, you know, and, and you see the, uh, you know, we see the, the influence of the Indian and Spanish pageant, right? It would, would be a very unique thing to, to them here on the West Coast and this kind of um, mission 
a sense of history and um, a, a, a very strong um, optimism, you know, very, very um, kind of optimistic viewpoint. Um, and so a, a lot of those kind of things are, are put out here. They, they, where, they, you know, where it says the College of Fine Arts, is that USC? Yes, so this yes. would have been the college, yeah. So the building that I showed you, and I'll, sh I'll show you the, uh, another shot of it, um, is, is the college, as you see there, the campus of the College of Fine Arts. And so the Royal Guild, it's also the, head, the, the headquarters of the Royal Guild. Mm -hmm. So the Royal Guild and the university are, are both housed in that building. Mm -hmm. And um, again, Jud Judson, you know, kind of responsible for kind of getting them both underway, at least, at least under the same roof. And well, it's inter in interesting to read this because they constantly were talking about expanding and had the idea of wanting to expand and, and they will expand um, the building. And then they're looking for larger kind of compounds almost um, to, to expand too, because it's, you know, they've created this community that, that, you know, supposedly kind of continuing to grow. So this is 1909, as you see there. Well, and you can see the more, um, Morris influence here too, as well. I mean, um, you know, this is the guild who make beautiful things for use. Um, and in the paragraph below it, there's a lot of the influence of, of Morris and Ruskin, you know, through Morris right there, even in the text. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's taken directly from all of that and, right. and very much uh, uh, English arts and crafts influence on it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll read a quote, I have a quote here. It says, um, an excerpt in, in this promotional material, I'm just showing you the covers of these two um, in particular, but one of them says, all lovers of beautiful things and all people who desire to make life better, worth living, are invited to join forces and help further the purposes of the guild. And then it says, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and there you see the, the we can, yeah. right? And the rising <laughs> sun we can, and, yeah. and the hammer and, you know, this, mm -hmm. this whole thing. So, um, yeah, we did it before, uh, before Nike, right? Just do it. Yep. <laughs> Before Obama, we can. Before Obama, yeah. <laughs> Before the grape, uh, you know, ban on grapes or the right. <laughs> and the well, quarter I can see here. There's an article. Dollar, it says it's a dollar per year, twenty-five yeah. cents a copy. Yep. And uh, yeah, if you paid a dollar, you got sold short because this was the only one they did. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get past volume one, number one. So, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a really, you know, interesting thing, you know, because the, you know, talking about the influence of the English influence and William Morris and stuff, there's very much a Victorian kind of, you know, overshadow of this, right? It's kind of yeah. like this sense of, um, you know, proper, the way things should be and, you know, the a proper nature of being and, and that kind of thing. But at the same time, very, very freeing and very kind of looking around the corner or looking, you know, ahead to, to kind of what's yeah. to come. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to fathom, you know, being in Los Angeles during this time, right? Where there's, there's, you know, the sky's the limit. It's like blank slate basically, right. Mm -hmm. To, to build on. And so, um, so I think the optimism was, and, and you, you know, Judson obviously felt better. I mean, he came out in 93 and was, you know, basically after his doctor telling him to die, he didn't die until 1928. Wow. So, um, you know, I think that was what California does for us too, to a certain extent. Um, so yeah, so he's, he's real involved here um, with that. Um, I, I put this up. This is um, some LA Times or maybe Herald articles. I, I don't have them noted here, but um, basically, there was a, uh, if, if you guys know Mount Lowe, you've probably heard of Mount Lowe um, and the San Gabriels. Um, there used to be a, a funicular that ran up the San Gabriel Mountain that was um, done by Lowe. Well, Lowe, uh, the story you don't hear about Lowe is that he started a, a factory in, um, in the Arroyo Seco. And um, so that was um, blowing smoke up into the community. And so the building, the, 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 you know, the Royal Guild, the USC camp, the School of Fine Arts uh, became a, kind of a gathering place to fight this. And, and uh, they asked Lowe to shut it down. He didn't. And so Judson finally sued him and won. Oh. 
And so, you know, I kind of, I like to throw that in there because he's an environmentalist too, right? Which is so yeah. important to, to uh, Ruskinian. Uh, that same year, the building burned down. I don't know how. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy or anything, but. <laughs> Strange <laughs> coincidence. The, the kilns burned down and then it was rebuilt. And so this is the new building. Very, very different in feel. Very different. Very, and very, larger too. It, it seems larger. Yeah. Well. Quite a bit. Expanded it. So everything kind of where you see the stairs there on the left over to the right was, was new. Okay. And um, so upstairs were the women's dormitories. As you saw, all the women's students were the dormitories upstairs. And then the rest of the buildings were, um, were studios. The rest of the part of the buildings were, were studios. It seems more of an arts and crafts um, style yeah, with this building. So. Yeah. Very much so. And, and Train and Williams were the designers of this building. And Train and Williams were um, arts and crafts architects in Los Angeles at that time. And they actually designed some pretty important buildings, uh, some major uh, arts and crafts residential buildings. Um, they designed Angel's Flight. So um, they were pretty significant, but they were the official kind of uh, architects of the Royal Guild. And, and uh, Williams actually lived up the street from here. Okay. And some people ask about the guild and when it might have, um, you know, when it might have um, died out because it kind of, you know, we don't hear much for it, but obviously it was going in 1910 when they, they built this and, and you know, I, it's probably World War I that kind of uh, kills the guild. Yeah. Um, and, but, and it remains, the building remains the school until 1920. So this is another shot. Okay. You can see it's grown. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's still yeah. primarily women. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's really interesting that, uh, another interesting kind of fun con connection is if, if you can see on the lower right, I don't know if you can see in the front row, the guy with the dark hair and the black hat and- um, Sitting got, down? Yeah, sitting down yeah. on the ground, yeah. So the, he um, was a very famous model and um, he actually modeled for Burne Jones. Oh. And um, it was, you know, it was English, uh, Italian descent. Um, and his name's slipping okay. my mind for some reason. Uh, Antonio Corsi was his name. Okay. And, um, okay. and he came to New York. He actually was a, 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 a model for John Singer Sargent. And, um, and then Judson, uh, he asked Judson for a job and said, yeah, come on out. And um, he supposedly had massive parties. They used to march through the streets. <laughs> supposedly a lot of fun. Colorful but, character all the way around, yeah, sounds oh like. Gosh, yeah. yeah. And he was trying to kind of get into the, the movie motion picture business at that time, which would have been pretty early. But, um, but uh, yeah, pretty, pretty famous um, model, which I think is an interesting tie. Well. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to try and figure out what he, what paintings he modeled for, for Burn Jones. Yeah. That could be tough. <laughs> well, there is a guy who's doing uh, research on him and has all of that information and, and uh, is doing okay. a documentary. And I think there's a book on him. So. Oh, all right. So there is information out there. Excellent. Yeah. 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 And he's in some pretty famous pieces. So that I, the score, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, you know, I want to make sure that we leave time to get to all the things you're doing now, too. Yeah. So um, not that I want to rush you through this, because I find this all very fascinating. I just want to make yeah. sure that we do leave that time um, as we move as we move along. Yeah, so this is really the Judson founding of the Judson Studios. These are the Judson sons. And that's my great grandfather there with that cool mustache in the middle. Mm. And um, this is before the fire. So this has been a little bit early, oh, okay. early on. Um, but they start their company in downtown um, in um, 1897. Um, this isn't that early, but this is a little bit later. As you see, the, the address is on there. Um, mm -hmm. But they had, and they, they kept a showroom downtown and, and, um, and then moved, when they moved into the building. So this is probably after 1920 when they moved into the building. Um, but, you know, the arts and crafts connection continues. This is the Abbey San Encino which is around the block. They do a, it's very close to them. They did this window, um, which again, I think epitomizes the arts and crafts movement here in the area. Early work, um, which I'll kind of get into a little bit here, but this is down at Inglewood Mausoleum and I'll, I'll circle back to these windows, but these are some kind of early, almost Tiffany-like windows. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, this is the dome at the Natural History Museum. Ruth, you probably look at this wow. building throughout your career. 
yes. sitting across the street. <laughs> and I, and I, I've, known, I've known from the beginning that this was uh, a Judson. Yeah. Window. And um, so, and this would have been work. the fine arts. Yeah, this is 1914, and and this is um, this would have been the the fine arts building at the time. It's a natural mm -hmm. history museum now, but it was the fine arts building I think until the 50s or 60s, if I remember. And and mm -hmm. um, we've restored that window as well, which is kind of interesting. I just I'm just stunned by. I mean, it's it's they hadn't they'd only founded the studios. What did you say, 1910 or so? Um, What's that? The I mean, Joseph it's just it's early work, but it's so accomplished already. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there wasn't a lot of folks in town doing it, right? That was one of the reasons. Um, but yeah, they, and, and I think William Lees was, was pretty uh, involved in the community. And so I think they were, you know, um, kind of hit the ground running, so to speak. Yeah. Um, this is the LA Central Library, a little bit later, 26. This is a good hue building. And um, the, um, this is, um, let me think of the artist's name, but the artist who did all this, that's the, you see the zodiac symbols there? That's the same artist who did the um, uh, Atlas Shrugged in Rockefeller Center. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember the name either. Yeah. Although I've, you know, I used to live in New York. I've seen that so many times that I can't <laughs> remember the name either. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, there are a lot of arts and crafts churches. Um, oh. And, and, this? and this is the, um, image that we talked about. And again, kind of a direct influence, right, of, of Burne Jones on, on the crowd there. And um, this is a great window. It's in the chapel on the south side of the building, one of my favorite windows. And um, I didn't know it. I mean, it was, uh, I was actually touring a, an Englishman around, a, a stained glass expert. And, and he said, yeah, that's, I think that's a, a, based on a Burne Jones painting. And so, um, so I tracked it down and, and uh, that's in the book as well. So you can kind of see those in the book. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the early days, you know, um, and I think, you know, part of what I, you know, want to talk about too, Sarah, is the, 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 the tie in with Ruskin and, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, this idea of kind of pivoting from, okay, you know, the arts and crafts idea up until the twenties, right. Is, pretty straightforward, but then what happens, right? And, and how, where do we go from there? And how does Ruskin, yeah. how does Ruskin kind of um, play into this kind of transition? And so, um, you know, I love, I love to show this photo, with Ruskin being kind of uh, a huge fan of Chart, Chart Cathedral and spent a lot of time there um, studying medieval glass. And, you know, he, he claims that 12th and 13th century glass is, you know, kind of the most important or, you know, cannot be surpassed. The epitome so, of... Yeah. Yeah. So, it's like, we can all go home now because it's already right. been done. <laughs> it's been done. We've, we've, we've reached, the, we've reached the zenith. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is 1844 when he's really researching all of this and he's traveling to the continent and... Um, uh, studying windows because his home parish in London is asked that he design a stained glass window, yeah. which is really interesting. This is 1844, so he would have been 20 something. Yeah, I mean, he would have uh, been just out of out of university. Well, a few years yeah. out. Yeah. So he's he's you know going to all the cathedrals, and we know how much time he spent in the cathedrals. But early on, he was really looking at the glass and and just kind of. Uh, there's a lot of letters. Actually, you pointed me to these. Uh, I remember a while back. Yeah, the letters on stained glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, so this is the window that he designs uh, he, in 1844 um, with a, a class made of his, and um, it's d built in London. And it's, I haven't seen it in person. And I'm sorry, it's not a very good picture, but um, but this idea of studying glass, and and you know how he jumped into something. He he left no stone unturned, right? So no, <laughs> he climbed up ladders and got as close as he could and took yeah. notes and sketches and he was very hands-on, yeah. And so of course, you know, this idea of fine art is that which the hand, the head and the heart of man go together. And this is, um, you know, I think really the epitome of stained glass, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when, when I started looking at Ruskin and, and um, you know, what was Ruskin's viewpoint on stained glass, because you don't really hear much about that, uh, you know, right. 
and I, and I realize why is because it's, he's, it's pretty straightforward. I, like I said, you know, 12th century, 13th century glass is pretty much where it's at. Um, I'll get into a little bit more too about some of the other ideas, but I think what resonates with me and I think what resonates with a lot of decisions that I'm making today as a 21st century um, glass, you know, artisan and artist is, is the material, right? And, and driving the material. And I, and I think this quote is so great. So all art working with given materials must propose to itself the objects which with those materials are most perfectly attainable mm -hmm. and becomes illeg illegitimate and debased if it proposes it to itself any other objects better attainable with other materials. Right. And, you know, again, I think glass is such a, you know, um, kind of a, a significant um, thing for that because he really does go into it and really leans into it and and um, again, another window of Chart. And, and so, you know, um, what he talks about when he's talking about these windows is, is um, there's really four ideas that I took out of what he wrote um, about glass and the material of glass. And one of them is called ductility. And ductility is kind of like more for like three-dimensional if you're blowing glass or, or manipulating glass it's a very, you know, it's not like steel where you're, you have to hammer it, right? Glass, when it's molten, is very kind of fluid and moves. And then his other one is transparency. Mm -hmm. And the transparency is super important because in the 18th century, you know, before stained glass kind of comes about, um, artists become, uh, stained glass has become like this painting, right? Like they're, yeah. uh, Joshua Reynolds did this piece in Oxford and, and it was, you know, he never loved it. <laughs> And it was kind of a, a subject of debate because really, as you can see, if you look closely, these are all rectangles, right? right. There's no leading. You, you, know, you notice the leading on the left-hand side mm -hmm. and look at the leading on the right. It's just squares, right? And so all those figures are painted on glass with enamels. And enamels don't have the transparency that glass does. And yeah. so uh, Ruskin hated, like this was like the worst thing. And it was to him, it, it really took away uh, what stained glass should be. And using the glass, yeah. yeah, I was gonna say it's using the glass as a canvas rather than as glass, right? Exactly. It's like exactly. a falseness in the, in, in the use of the material. Exactly, and that's, so he's, he's, he's basically saying, you know, like you're, you're taking away everything that glass is supposed to be and how wonderful it is and, and all of these things. And so, um, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, he felt very strongly about this and wrote, um, wrote quite a bit about it, um, this idea of, the character of glass and what glass should look like. But, um, you know, so there's two things going on at this time. One is, um, you know, this revival resurgence or renewed interest in medieval things, right? And that's kind of where we see the pre-Raphaelites coming about and that kind of thing. And then also um, to do that as a material. So there's this push for glass to be uh, reinstated, which it's not. At that time, blown glass is basically, um, gone away. I mean, it's, it's not an industry anymore. And there's, there's kind of two major things that change. One is uh, the Germans start doing it. Can, uh, uh, Ludwig I kind of starts this industry of, of glass blowing, which then German glass becomes more prevalent in Great Britain, which then becomes more um, challenging for, for the, you know, it's like, well, you're putting German stained glass in your English cathedrals. There's nothing more sa sacred right. than that, right? So, yeah. Um, and then uh, the English create, uh, they get rid of a glass tax. And then, so there's an economic benefit as well. And so, so there's this redevelopment of that. And, and so here's some of the German glass that's being made at that time. And here's what the English are doing. And I, and I like to show these, this is actually the Huntington too. So maybe those of you in Pasadena that want to see it. Um, and, and so there's, you know, he's very upset too about this idea. There's a major difference between these two in that mm -hmm. the Germans on the right are creating these pictures, right? So to speak, again, it's like creating perspective, right? Whereas on the English window does not. They're kind of maintaining these kind of medieval concepts, but they're, they're making them renew, right? Which is, again, they, this idea of not copying the medieval windows, but building on them. And not just um, the idea of not just imitating, because that's something else that Ruskin writes a lot about is um, very much he's so. very against just the idea of imitation even in painting and in, in all the other arts as well. Right. 
And that journey, the window, the mayor window, you can see that's a little bit of a later window, but those are down at the cathedral. If, if anybody's interested in going down to the, the basement of the cathedral, you can go see those. And then this concept of transparency, all these things kind of, kind of happens in the United States too. This is a Tiffany window um, at All Saints. Um, and again, Tiffany used this opalescent glass. So it wasn't trans transparent. And um, Charles Connick, who was uh, out of the Boston area, uh, totally plugged into the arts and crafts movement in, in um, uh, England uh, is doing this. And so you see this kind of huge shift or split in the glass movement at that time. And so trying to get us into, <laughs> trying to get us out of realizing that we're, we're, we're going through all our time here, but yeah. um, so in terms of design, you know, material is one thing, design is another, right? And, and so, you know, how do we go back to Ruskin thinking about design, if you're use, you know, saying that the medieval glass is the best thing, you know, but then on the other side, he, he champions Turner, right? Who kind of, in a way, blows Who's up. He's a man of contradictions, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Uh, exactly. And so, you know, we have this Bauhaus movement, I think, again, with tying in with the arts and crafts, uh, you see it in the United States with Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going to kind of go through these quickly. But um, and these are Judson windows. So Judson worked with Frank Lloyd Wright on both the Hollyhock and the um, um, the Innes House, and we've restored these windows as well. And I had these photographed for the book. Um, these windows, it's a little less clear about who designed these windows. Um, they're not designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, but Judson did do them. So. Um, but we saw some catalogs of, of uh, firms that um, Wright worked with um, that probably influenced these designs. And then uh, we get into kind of the depression, World War II. Wow. And again, one of the themes of my books is um, this idea of like the history of Los Angeles. And I see all of these buildings going up into the, you know, starting from the late 19th century up into the, you know, the depression, and then everything kind of basically stops. Right, and, and so it's not until after the war that things start popping up again. But again, one of these divisions that I think has led to a lot of my uh, decisions today and a lot of what Ruskin was wrestling with with the Germans back then too, is you know, this is the, where the Germans went in the 50s, right? And this is what we were doing in the 50s. <laughs> so it's this huge, huge diaspora between uh, where stained glass firms really go and the tastes that you see in, in, in Europe versus the United States. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I attribute that to, to, to various things, but, you know, and that being said, it's not all that, right? Here's, here's this, this is the Air Force Academy Chapel yeah. in Colorado. Um, where I've been and didn't realize, of course, years ago, didn't realize, you know, that you, your firm had done these and found yeah. that out reading your book. And um, I mean, it's, it's a stunning place. Yeah, it's spectacular. And uh, we're restoring, we're going to be restoring these. We're in the process of restoring these. Um, I was actually on a scaffold that went to the very top of that roof not too long ago. It's, wow. it's a, little, <laughs> a little scary. A little nerve wracking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I want to, so, so if we jump to, to kind of more contemporary times, again, um, Guy Kemper is an American artist, mm -hmm. but he gets all of his glass done in Germany, right? And so, being a business person myself, thinking about this, all the American artists going to Germany, you know, that doesn't seem right, right? Why, why are you, you know, we, we can very, be very capable of making glass and, you know, but this is the work we're doing, right? And so, you know, this is a Judson design. And again, I'm, I'm generalizing here, this isn't all we do, um, but, you know, what I found is that, okay, if this is the projects we're gonna get, let's, let's do this as good as we can. And, and I did have my painters trained with, with other painters back East and, and European painters to really, uh, you know, kind of um, learn how to paint glass and really understand the history of glass and what you can do with it. And, you know, luckily that led, led us to this project um, at the uh, Crusoe Catholic Center at USC. And um, these are all new windows that we created. Um, we got to work with other artists. So um, this is a Gail Roski uh, design, who's a watercolorist. And she, she designed this window that we then created with fused glass. Um, Ruth, I don't have your window in here, but we work with Ruth on a couple of windows for this. So collaborations were really important to, uh, uh, you know, this, this push of collaborating with other artists because so many of the artists are going to Germany. I wanted to, to tie them in. 
And then we, we bit the bullet and we moved to the computer. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> this seems like a really long time ago, but you know, it's really not. I mean, we really uh, shunned the computer for a lot of times being the Ruskinites and Luddites that we were, but but even Ruskin used the uh, railroad, even though he, yeah. <laughs> he fulminated against it, but he used the railroad. <laughs> yeah. And designing became just a whole, uh, you know, it opened us up to a lot of possibilities, a lot of technical things that we could do. So like that cartoon that you see of the line there, the black and white drawing, that would have been done by hand, you know, and mm -hmm. like you see the Burne Jones cartoons, they're, they're absolutely fantastic, you know, that he did for Morrison Company. And um, but for, you know, they get rolled up and they get stuffed into the archives never to be seen again, right? But where if we can spend time painting on the glass, that's really what people are going to see and what, what we really want to spend our time to. And so we're able to create these, you know, these kind of amazing windows that I don't think we would been able to do without the computer. Plus we got pushed. We, we only had two and a half years to make them. So <laughs> it was like uh, several thousand feet of, of uh, glass. Or a thousand, you know, around a thousand feet. And then, you know, that, that led to this project, um, which was a, a church being built in Kansas that decided that stained glass would what make their space sacred. And so um, they uh, selected out of dozens of entries, they selected two studios, and it's these two. So I bring you back to these two you. images. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. This is a very interesting thing to think about this traditional studio versus very contemporary kind of uh, approach. And uh, this is the design that we did to get that job. And again, we, we showed them what we could do with the computer and this is where it ended up. So all that computer uh, investment in the computer and computer design really allowed us to, really, yeah. uh, to sell this project in essence. This, this is such a vast space and the window is so enormous. Um, I mean, is this the largest project as far as the largest window that you've done or? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, and so good. what kind of challenges does that present technically as far as just the, the practical aspects of not so much the design, but the, you know, making the window, installing all of that, installing the window. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I like to talk about this idea looking at what the Germans were doing and what we were doing and how could we you know, they wanted something that was figurative, which played in our favor as a, as a more traditional studio, right? And, and have a narrative base to it. But then, um, you know, when we were designing this and Tim Carey, my designer at the time said, you know, I said, just, just design it. We'll, we'll figure out, like make it contemporary, make it like, don't think about how we're gonna make it. Just think about the design of it. And, and it. So, so that's really what pushed us. And you can see it's, it's um, how big it is. That's a, that's a <laughs> school bus. Yeah. <laughs> 3,400 square feet. And so we did design it and, and, you know, we scratched our heads for quite a while to try to figure out what we could do. And, uh, you know, and then Tim, we, we realized, okay, we need help. And so we went out and we found this guy, Narcissus Quagliata, and he, he had done this piece. This is a 7,000 square foot. So this wow. is twice the size of the piece we did. And um, he did this with a German firm. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't, don't you call this at one point the German problem? Is that yes. your phrase? Yeah, it's yeah, I, okay, I call I it the German so. problem. Yeah. Exactly. And so this is the, 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 the thread through this history of stained glass and, and, and uh, us included in that um, kind of conundrum. Um, but what makes this very American, and that's a very good, this is a very good time to talk about that because um, some of this is fused glass and what Narcissus does is fused glass, but only like a third of this, maybe a quarter of it is fused glass. Most of this is painted glass. So like float glass, that's enamel painted, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so there's something that, um, you know, when you're working at the scale kind of uh, necessitates it. But I think what's more interesting is thinking about the material of glass and what we can do with glass to make it contemporary. And so that's what we thought would be the answer for Kansas is that we didn't want to paint it, but we wanted to work with the glass. And so Narcissus was one of the, the few people that could do that and get us there. Mm -hmm. And Narcissus, that's him on the right. I, I, I'd love okay. to put up this picture. This is at um, Pilchuck and he's leaning on Dale Chihuly. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you probably know, most of you probably know who Dale Chihuly was, but um, I guess at Pilchuck they used to, the guys dressed as uh, girls and the girls dressed up as guys one night and, and during the summers, but I, I can only imagine what Pilchuck must have been like in the <laughs> 70s and 80s. But, uh, but Narcissus taught um, 
stained glass at Pilchuck. And Pilchuck is mostly hot glass, what we call hot glass. And this gets into the ductility um, idea that, that, I, that I believe Ruskin um, talked about. But what I find now, kind of how we're able to bring that in, he, he did it, thought of it more as three-dimensional, but I, we're working now in two-dimensional, this ductility, bringing it into the two-dimensional while maintaining that transparency. And so, you know, Chihuly, as you know, uh, is a glass blower. There he is very young before, before the eye patch days, probably a few pounds yeah. lighter. You know, and Chihuly's work like, look like this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is Narcissus's work. So he's a two-dimensional artist living in a three-dimensional world, right? And mm -hmm. so seeing all this beautiful glass blown, how does he bring that in to what he's doing? And so he just started designing these rondelles. You can see on the left-hand side, these kind of spun rondelles. And so he could design this glass, put it on a marver table there. You see on the right-hand side, that's the marver table, which is a steel table that they roll the molten glass on. So you see, they, they gather up the molten glass and roll it onto this frit, which is basically called frit. Okay. And, you know, you start blowing it and spinning it and blowing it. You can add molten glass to it. There's Narcissus adding molten glass to it. And see, that's what it looks like as you're adding glass to it. Mm -hmm. Keep blowing it. And then you end up with something like this, right? And so if you can imagine like starting to be able to realize this material, you can manipulate and, and kind of try and build on. And so he started with these, um, these ideas of rondelles but what he really wanted was the bits, right? How do, I, how do I get the little bits and incorporate those? And so he was doing this cutting up these pieces that he was having custom made and being able to do stuff like this, right? That, you know, combining traditional glass painting. But what we found is like, they're extremely difficult to make at that time. So if you've ever seen the glass, the, the leading of the glass, you can see the lead came in there and all the squiggly lines and all that kind of stuff. There's no way, like you can't, oh my gosh. you can't, you know, it takes forever to make, you know, you can't um, sell it at a decent price. And so, um, so we went to Bullseye, which is Portland, where you are. Yes, yeah, and yeah. Um, this is where warm glass comes into, that. so the, the idea of taking the hot glass concept and moving it into a two-dimensional world, um, you start working on it on a flat surface, right? So, so you're not, this means you're not blowing it as in exactly. those pictures you were showing. So you don't have, have that step is not no longer part of the process. Exactly. And okay. so how do you take that glass and work in a two dimensional form? And so um, you can see it on the, t on this table on a flat surface and you see the, the, the oven or the kiln on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. Here it is super hot. And then he's got a steel rod where he's scratching the surface of the glass while it's molten to create these kind of shapes. Okay. And so this is the head. This is an early head that he did. And you can see this is 93. And um, you can see the shoulders at the bottom. And oh, um, yeah. so this was kind of an intriguing thing for him. It was totally experimental at the time. Um, and the, 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 what was happening was that bullseye was making glasses compatible. So this goes back to the technology of the materials and that if you look at traditional art glass and you put two colors together, they'll stress each other out because they have different rates of expansion. They're, okay. they're, um, because they're made up of different mineral oxides. Mm -hmm. But Bullseye figured out a way to make their glasses compatible. And so he went back down to the Bay Area. This is um, with David Ruth, uh, another famous Bay Area artist, glass artist. And they started playing around with this molten glass in the kilns. And then you see the heads there they become much more wow. sophisticated. I mean, it's, there's a, a, an element of, a significant element of chemistry involved, right? I yeah, mean, very much so. Yeah. I, I think of ceramics too, is, is like that with glazes and all those sort of things. I mean, you, yeah. these are things that- so You have to, you know, different glasses react differently. Mm -hmm. um, there's different firing schedules, all of those kind right. of things play into it, definitely. But, you know, talking about Ruskin and material, this really intrigued us in the sense that we didn't want to just paint enamel, colored enamels onto the surface of the glass, mm -hmm. right? We wanted to actually manipulate the glass. And Narcissus, you know, was interested in the figure, which was again, something we wanted to pursue. Um, it was architectural. This is one of the first major fused glass pieces ever to be built. And then he continued with the heads, the kind of idea, the movement of glass, right? So yeah. rather than just spinning the glass, he was looking at 
creating what we now call sliders of, of, of tilting kiln shelves and letting glass slide down the shelves to create this movement in the glass. And then tying painting into it. Well, it's interesting too, to me with those heads because he's capturing the movement of, you know, the hair, the neck and all that, but also working with the fluidity of, I mean, glass, when it's molten, it's fluid. And so that idea is captured there as well as you've got layers of meaning in those pieces. Yeah, definitely. And it's, and it's this kind of living art form, right? That you can kind of train it to do something, but you don't know exactly what it's going to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And we learn from every project. Every, every project um, teaches us something new. And so you asked about the, the making of it and what we did. And so we talked, we convinced Narcissus to come down. We started testing things. You know, he'd never done anything like this. You know, he was kind of at a, you know, he's in his mid seventies, kind of at a point in his career where he wanted to really share his, his, ta his kind of body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so we went up to Bullseye. This is Dan Shore, who's the owner of Bullseye. Okay. And we said, look, we want to fuse this 3,400 foot window. It's never been done before. Will you help us do it? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so we made one of our first panels up there. And this helped raise money for the church too. But what intrigued us was this idea of, of hand painting, combining it with color, right? This idea, so all of these colors being built up. Um, but the problem is that we're in a 120 year old building that has, you know, 50 amps of electricity or whatever, <laughs> and we needed kilns. Right. So we founded this new space. And again, this is what really pushed me to, to, to look into the history to make a decision like this and go this route mm -hmm. you know, and think about where we could go, incorporate Frit, which is kind of like really, you know, how do we create something like that? You know, so the lion that I showed you before for USC mm -hmm. and a fritted lion. Hmm. Can you just explain that term? Of, of, is that, um little the pieces the little pieces of glass that were on that table you were showing us yeah exactly okay. and, and i'll show you in a second some more for it so so what we would do is we'd paint on a base surface mm -hmm. um which i think ruskin would approve of and then we add descriptive cut glass or colored glass on top okay. of it and then we could pour the frit so you see those areas of frit and the trick of Frit, the problem is that you're basically, you know, when you're painting a painting, you're, it's, it's kind of revealing itself, right? Mm -hmm. When you're fritting glass, it's kind of disappearing. <laughs> so you're kind of, you know, trying to figure out how you, how you build that up. But you see even all the detail just in the eye of the lion. Wow. Another thing we did, this is something that um, Narcissus really kind of led um, this is, is taking the frit and putting it in the kiln, mm -hmm. creating like these big brush strokes okay. and really, you know, playing with the material to then incorporate it, you know, two dimensionally. So if we can create this pre-made material, we can build on that to create all these amazing effects and, you know, with the color. But something you just said made me think to you said working with the material and, and all of this um, it sounds to me like you've been led by the material. The material is leading the way. You're working with the material, respecting the material, what the material can do, um, which is still very Ruskinian, even though this is so different from anything that Ruskin probably could have envisioned. Yeah. I mean, he, he never thought, uh, but no one did at this point, you know, that right. you could take glass and manipulate it to create, you know, basically anything you wanted. Mm -hmm. And the head, I think, is probably the most important piece. And a similar idea of taking pre-made materials, cutting them up. You see them on the right-hand side there, just big sheets of, of, of glass that we created ourselves and then cut up to basically build a mosaic, right? So mosaic the pieces onto the painted glass. Mm -hmm. And there it is before it goes in the kiln. Wow. You know, I think those eyes are just spectacular. Oh, yeah. That's a I mean, five the level head. of detail is, yeah. is amazing. Yeah. And this idea of that they, they didn't want, you know, it was a huge debate throughout the project of what Christ would look like, right? And the idea of, you know, how do you make Christ not look 
white or, you know, something mm -hmm. specific, you know, how do you allow people to, to interpret what, what they see? Here's a, during the installation process and there it is installed. So really I want to get you just to kind of wrap up. And we, we talked about this yeah. there about, you know, where do we go from here and how do we deal with it? And, yeah, one of them is we keep Narcissus around. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a project he did uh, for residents, believe it or not. This is all fused glass. So he's, he's made several domes in his life. This is the only one he's ever done that's fully fused. Mm -hmm. And then we, took, we went out to the, find other artists. And so we wanted to work with other artists in the medium. Street painters were one of the first that really took to it. You know, it's kind of a natural shift. Yeah. And... Um, so David Flores made this piece called The Street Painter. And it showed up at the Sullivan Goss Gallery up in Santa Barbara. You know, and this idea of crossing the lines into a gallery setting, I think, was is an interesting idea, too. This is a mere fall. Uh, so that piece, that's hundreds of colors of pieces that then got fused into a single piece. That's wow. a single, this is a self-portrait. Um, he's Iranian-American, and he, all of his figures are or their heads are covered. Okay. The sock monkey. And the sock monkey. Yeah, I was going to ask about the sock monkey. <laughs> yeah. So he has all of his, his figures. He, when he poses them, they all are supposed to have something very personal to them, something very meaningful in their lives. And so for him, the sock monkey was really important when he was, you know, immigrating to the United States. And so mm -hmm. that was kind of a... I just, I was wondering, with pieces like this, where they're being designed as individual freestanding art pieces. Where does the consideration with light come in? If they're not going to be, you know, a window or hung in, the, I mean, in the gallery, it looks like they may be illuminated from behind, but how does yeah. that, how does that function as part of the design process and the choice of, um, you know, the glass and how you work with it? Or does it? I mean, I'm just interested in how that- Oh yeah, works. definitely. Well, yeah. and these, these are backlighted and we have, you know, right. backlighting scenarios. And so we, we use like a, an LED, uh, pad and it's like a quarter of an inch so we can get a nice even light on it and okay. um, so you know it's not ideal but for a gallery setting it's it is what it is you know you can mm -hmm. dim them so they can change lights but it is an artificial light okay. uh, box some you know we really a lot of this has to do with public art and I think public art is an interesting idea and a very kind of democratic Kind of you know public arts come a long ways in a short amount of time but you know i think ruskin would like the idea or the concept of public art yeah i think you're right especially public art that is made with such attention to material and detail yeah yeah i'm really i'm glad you included this especially just lately this seems very fitting <laughs> to have this particular window but it's also it's so dramatic and there's so much motion in it as well um, and the colors are, I mean, you can feel that the heat in this, in this piece, yeah. it's, I think it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. As the West coast burns down. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the other interesting ideas talking about materials is the idea of lead, right? So this is a fairly large piece. It's about five feet, almost four feet wide, but there's no lead in it. It's driving the conservators mad. They don't know yeah. they to address that, but. We'll let them address that. <laughs> um, this is a Sarah Kane piece at the San Francisco airport. Oh, okay. James Jean, another fairly well-known uh, artist, um, kind of a designer, kind of, you know, a lot of comic book influence, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, this piece is in Portland, probably. I think the, uh, not in Portland, but um, in Oregon, it's, uh, was oh. purchased by the CEO of Nike. He's a big oh, okay. Nike. I wonder yeah. if it's at the headquarters then. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where he where he put them. Yeah. James really took to glass, and so we started talking about, you know, well, what if we made a three dimensional piece? And so he designed that piece, which ended up being this piece, wow. about eight feet tall. And this is what it looks like flattened mm -hmm. out. And this is interesting too, because we do, he likes all of his lines to be really tight, and really perfect. And so we have to water jet these pieces. We can't hand cut them, but this is all fused glass. That's then uh, hand painted, airbrushed and um, uh, fused together to, to create, you know, these, these figures. 
How many hours go into a piece like that? A lot. I mean, just, I know, but I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. it's just the amount of work is, is, is gotta be. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty daunting. Yeah. These, yeah. we've been really lucky that James has a, has a support base to be able to fund these. Okay. And this is the one we're working on now. He, and this is still looking for a home, but you know, with this three, this idea of the three dimensional thing. So at night, it's, you can light it from the inside and during the day, you'll be able to walk inside of it. Oh, so wow. these are some conceptual ideas that um, I actually have a meeting with him tomorrow to kind of think about, were you able to walk into it? There's a bench that'll be on the base. Um, you you're creating kind of a reflecting pool around it and then you'll mm -hmm. walk down under the water oh, into oh, it. Wow. So it's, it's kind of interesting to think, well, where can we take this and what the, what's the experience of glass? And, you know, one of the things that Ruskin talked a lot about was the spiritual character of glass, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that, um, you know, this idea of, of natural light, you know, and the experience of walking into a cathedral and, um, you know, just having natural light, working through a natural material and what that does. Yeah. Um, well, and light was such light and it was such a spiritual thing for him and the way he writes about light in so many of his works. Yeah. I um, mean, you know, light is aligned with vision and with seeing clearly and all of those ideas that kind of come together. Um, so you can understand why he would um, bring that to ideas about glass as well. Definitely. Um, and, you know, he, he wrote about it, you know, kind of through his life. He, he's, he had a lot of drawings done of, of the windows too that um, he collected over the years as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then, and then getting back to this idea of craft and, and making these windows and, you know, starting to work with other artists and realizing, okay, we're, we're starting to make things that we need a team that can actually actualize, right? We're, we're, we're realizing that we've reached a point that um, uh, there's a skill level and a knowledge of the material that has to be, you know, every project presents something different. And so Narcissus and I put together a program to give each of our artists a, a window. And um, so what I did is we went to um, the California Art Club. So I thought, well, this would be an interesting exercise to go back to this plein air painting and the idea of, of uh, interpreting plein air paintings into uh, art glass. And so, um, so we picked four painters, four very different paintings, very different techniques. Peter Adams is the, is the president, and this is uh, a piece that we picked of his. Mm -hmm. And so we combined all this knowledge that we had been building and, and we made all of these guys work on these pieces at the same time. And um, uh, actually we had two people working on this one, but uh, combining, trying to figure out the painting combined with the glass pre-made material and it ended up like this. Wow. And so, um, and these were just recently installed. They're, they're kind of interesting. This is a Carl Dempwolf piece. Uh, you know, as you can see, stylistically very different mm -hmm. and um the process was very different you see and where, where are they installed um these are down in inglewood mausoleum so okay. oh those, okay. those that i showed you earlier mm -hmm. these these are going with those and and um you know it's a really kind of interesting idea to think about you know these these windows that were made in the 19 teens going into the same building we didn't there's these four windows that were missing and we didn't want them, we didn't want to try to copy those windows, right? We wanted right. to do something, but we wanted them to tie in somehow. And um, so we, we felt that this was kind of an interesting way to pursue that. And, yeah. you know, so each of these are at kind of a, at the end of a mausoleum. This mm -hmm. is kind of a close up of it. You know, but it's almost like, you know, an impressionist painting in a way. You know, when you get up close to it, it yeah. looks like that I, I think of Cezanne when I see that. That's yeah, right. Cezanne. And then they're, so they're in the same building as these. And so I think it's kind of an interesting, you know, yeah. 20th century to the 21st century. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting evolution. Yeah, we've seen the arc of it. Mm -hmm. Here you can see them all together. Oh, they're beautiful. And this is the last time we'll ever see them all together. It's, it was sad to see these leave the studio. These are in the studio. Oh, I bet. Yeah. They'll never be seen together again. So it's kind of interesting to think about.
because they're they're at the end of these huge halls that you have to stand at the end of the hall to be able to see mm -hmm. it. So that's kind of it. Um, I wanted to let you. There's an exhibition at the Forest Lawn Museum, so uh, on Judson Glass, and also yes. showing the Forest Lawn Collection, which they have the Hearst Collection of stained glass, which is uh, pretty significant and of medieval glass. And so they've put together in their museum a, a collection of Judson painting, uh, Judson glass, and um, and their medieval collection. I like that image you have right there. Yeah. <laughs> Again, another a lot. artist, yeah. <laughs> well, this is That's one of our great. first uh, projects where we combine fusing and, and uh, traditional painting and lettering. Well, well it's, it's great because, you know, lettering is very medieval, but the image, you know, is, is I've never seen a young boy with a backpack and stained glass and the two of them <laughs> together and, and it works so well. Um, what a great image to end with after you've been talking about, uh, you know, try, the way that you've managed to you know, preserve those or, or those principles, you know, in the work that you yeah. do today. And, you know, here you have all, all of that kind of brought together in an image. So that's, I like that a lot. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because the artists, you know, that are interested in it like that, they like this idea of, you know, medieval concept and how they can contemporize mm -hmm. it in a way. Yeah. And I think that is, that is kind of a, uh, an interesting tie in with, with all of that. And, and, um, you know, I guess, being the studio and seeing the history that that you know we just went through it kind of makes sense that it attracts those kind of artists to that to it does that yeah, yeah. And, and it's not imitation it's an it's an expansion it's a development it's different it's innovative um it's it's yeah. something new infused with something old i really I, I love that yeah and i think that's where you kind of have to like when you read Ruskin and you learn more about it, you kind of have to pick and choose, right? To some extent. Right. <laughs> because I, I fully believe in his concept of philosophy of the materials, but um, mm -hmm. the design side maybe is, you know, the conversation kind of ends, right? Um, yeah, and, and, and you wouldn't want to just be doing the same thing or doing, you know, just medieval windows. I mean, look at all the wonderful, beautiful things that you've been able to make. Um, so different from anything, like as we said, Ruskin would ever have, have envisioned. And yet the values and principles are still underpinning it. Um, you know, we wouldn't want art to stand still. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think we should probably, we, we did go over and I, I know I realized that we did, but it was, it was also interesting. And I thought that you probably would want, the rest of you would want to see those images too and, and get to the end of those slides. So we're, we're beyond eight now, but we still have a bit of time for questions. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions, um, there's people here in chat saying thank you and fascinating, very interesting. A lot of thank yous here. But if anyone wants to ask questions, you can take yourself off mute and feel free to, to ask David a question. David, did Percy Gray know William Lee's Judson by chance? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I did not come across him in my, in my research. In, in the new com combination of facilities, is it possible to work with fused glass and stained glass in the same piece? Yes. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing a lot of, you know, it's um, interesting because if you think about fused glass, and this is where we're really, Ruth, kind of at a, an interesting point in the process mm -hmm. of fusing and where we take it because the lead now is kind of, uh, doesn't necessarily serve a, a practical purpose, right? There's, there's no need to cut one color of glass, run lead around it, and, and then piece it together. Um, but that being said, there's something to say about uh, the letting and piecing, piecing it together. Well, aesthetically, it, aesthetically. it demands, yes. And it creates kind of like a mosaic feel almost, right? Which, yes. is, which is what uh, the 19th century kind of glass returned to. And so in theory, you know, I showed you those, those paintings on glass that were mm -hmm. basically just rectangles, right? In theory, we could just create rectangles um not a good idea but it doesn't yeah exactly it doesn't work and so you know a lot of it ends up being a lot of where we're falling now um is you know uh like amir's pieces that i showed you are a combination of fused and and, mm -hmm. and uh regular glass um all of all of james's glass is all fused um but there is you you can combine them and and we have done that for traditional work as well interestingly enough you know to to Kind of use that the fusing technique to create interesting patterns and, and shades of color 
on the traditional patterns, uh, traditional designs. But um, yeah, I don't think we're ready to give up the lead and the lead lines really, we're seeing now Ruth like work around the figures for a lot mm -hmm. of times, you know, and this, this sense of like foreground background, it helps, helps to delineate a lot of those. And, kind of and just working with the leaded glass, you know, there's a kind of problem solving that's going on as well as an aesthetic solution that's very, very intriguing for the artist. Trust yeah, me. <laughs> and I, I would ask you about that too, about the idea, because you, you working in the studio and, and you're one of the artists who came in and really did your own painting. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, Ruth's Roos done probably three or four windows now with us. Um, and she's very hands-on, you, you get in there. And, and, you, and we had the conversations about the constraints that stained glass Mm -hmm. has on an artist and and you know that can you, be a, a positive an enormous uh challenge yeah well yeah like you said it's a problem solving you kind of have to f think about how that resolves certain issues and, and mm -hmm. aesthetically and and practically as well and right. and as a printmaker i think it's a little bit more of a natural yes inquiry, at least the glass painting and very you know, related to um, yeah but you think about that, like the designs, I didn't really go into it, but you know, like 15th century designs and, and um, you know, when the Getty had their exhibit and um, you know, Hans Holbein and Albrecht Durer and a lot of those, you know, they say a lot of them they may not know that, that were designing for stained glass and, and working with stained glass was kind of an interesting idea and, and how they moved that along you know the the idea of stained glass and how it changed from this medieval to uh to that period in the renaissance and stuff david i don't know if you can hear me or not this I is can eric jessen hi eric hi um eric jessen in laguna beach uh, you know, the background of my photo is the snow-covered eastern sierra nevada um i uh I'm just eternally grateful to you and Sarah and to Gabe for pulling this program together. It's absolutely over the top. It's just over the top. I'm so, so, so enriching for all of us. And I'm, I'm eternally grateful to you. Thank well, you thank so you. much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'd like to say something also along those lines. I think we all needed this. <laughs> 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 here, here. Yeah. It, has, it has been nice to sit and look at beautiful things and, and hear about something outside the norm of the news right now, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's better than last Tuesday night. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Can I ask about the exhibition on Forest Lawn? Do you have dates for that? No. I'm sorry. And I, I reached out to the curator today and I didn't hear back in time. Um, it is supposed to open this month, um, but as you know, the museums are kind of, mm. you know, trying to trying to do what they can with the guidelines they have. So, um, right. I think there's still a possibility of it opening up this month. Um, but if you follow them on Instagram or check out their website, I'm sure they'll they'll um, post that as soon as it's as soon as it's available. Thank you. That was fantastic, by the way. Absolutely oh, brilliant. <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you, David. It really was. It, I, I learned quite a bit tonight. Oh, good. Thank you. Is that Elena? <laughs> yes, it is. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Elena. I, you don't see me because I'm, in, I'm already in my night shirt. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> the beauty of Zoom, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. And we can buy the book, yes? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, that if uh, you can get it at Angel City um, online, they can sell you, and we'll get some signed copies out if you if you go through their okay, lovely website. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested as well. Very. So. Yeah, the book is. There's so many images in the book, and they're like I said, it's really beautifully produced. It's you can just pour over it. It's it's a fantastic book. Yeah, the book was um, was about uh, kind of in earnest about five years uh, making it. I mean, obviously thinking about it quite a bit, but um, the hard part, and, and there are about 300 images, almost 300 images in there. And um, picking images over the 120 years is, is very challenging. <laughs> that must've been hard. Yeah. Hard not to want to include everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, the publisher made sure that didn't happen. I'm sure, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Daddy. you can go ahead. Go ahead and, and say. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, David, this is David Jacobi. It's a great, great exhibit. Beautiful. Anyway, I, uh, I ended up with uh, Judson all the paintings rather than glasswork. And I still have four painting hanging on my walls. Oh, that's and fantastic. They're so beautiful. And uh, I wish I could visit again your, uh, your workshop, but we got the vice, uh, virus mm. to stop us from doing that. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very much. And uh, it's a beautiful, be beautiful exhibit. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you again and goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, yeah, and that that is uh, uh, David was able to visit the studio and we talked about some of the paintings that he had of Judson and and um, you know we do give tours. Uh, obviously, we're not giving tours right now, um, but we do do monthly tours of both facilities now. And um, so hopefully when, um, once kind of things get somewhat, somewhat back to normal, we'll start our tours again. And, and um, you know, the, the new space uh, is really fun because we have a, a gallery space. Um, I, I had a gallery at the old studio that has turned into a storage room just because of the amount of work we have, but we have a, a new gallery in the new space. And so we, we give, um, we have like a, a wrap party or whatever you call when we finish a project with an artist and the artist can invite all of their their friends over and it's kind of a, a nice way to kind of recognize yeah the yeah. process and and uh, bid it for for farewell um sarah this is yes. eric jessen again uh -huh. i i i just need to comment i unfortunately couldn't join the meeting until late because of another zoom commitment but uh -huh. So I don't know whether David Blue, you know, tooted his own horn, but his great great grandfather William Lee's Judson co-founded the California Plain Arts Arts Movement with yes, we, Saint Clair. And we did that, yeah, we went through all that. Eric. We did. We okay, talked about okay. that. Yeah. But, what, what, but, but what I wanted to get at is what I love is this flow line of of generations mm -hmm. of a family in the Southland and in Los Angeles in particular, starting with William Lees and going through all of these machinations uh, into, into the future. And it's, it's just absolutely stunning. It's just so uh, encouraging to all of us. Thank you. Well, I absolutely agree. Um, I, I think that it's the fact that, as I said to you before, David, that you know you're fifth, fifth generation, you know, running the studio, and you're doing work that is so different, so innovative, and yet grounded in, um, you know, the in the roots of the of the studio. I mean, it, it all it all works. It all it, it comes together, and I think that's one of the things that makes it so impressive. And the I fact can't. that you know you're training, you know, younger people presumably, you know, in this, in this craft. And, yeah, yeah. you know, we live in a society in which we're, we talk a lot about how we're losing a lot of the, the craft skills and handwork and all of that. And so to me, it's very inspiring to see, you know, you're showing these pictures of all these, you know, young artists and stuff working in this medium. Um, and that's, that's something that will, you know, it, it ensures that it's going to be carried on. These skills will be developed and, and, and they'll carry into the future. So. Yeah. The, the interest of young people has been really fascinating to see. And, and I think there is this return. I think, again, this parallel, I, you know, compare it to the industrial revolution, right? And it's kind of the digital revolution. And there's only so much digital digitalization we can take in our lives, right? And right. so to uh, see something that's handmade and is a natural material and, and is somewhat static to a certain extent, I think has a lot of value in today's society in the sense of, you know, just being able to um, 
kind of slow down for a little while and see something. Yeah. And, and um, you know, again, I think, you know, this idea is very interesting to me and why I still am active in the Ruskin Art Club is I think kind of Ruskin paved the way, right, to a certain extent of, you know, uh, these, these ideas that were developed that time uh, in so many ways are still applicable to today. And, um, yeah. you know, it's kind of interesting, the, um, um, as, as I talk about that, one of, the, one of the really difficult things was to try to figure out the cover of the book. Because, <laughs> oh. uh, you know, uh, we didn't want to pick something and make it feel too old, and we didn't want to pick something and make it feel too new, because there was so much history in it. And so it was a really hard thing to do, and it took me a long time to figure it out. And so uh, one day I went to Narcissus, and I said, Narcissus, I think, I think we want just glass on the cover of the book. And I think your slider kind of is emblematic to you know, this, this idea of a creating a slider of the glass sliding in the kiln would be mm -hmm. really emblematic, I said, but what I want you to do is use this palette. And so the colors that I selected were 19th century colors, mm -hmm. my favorite colors that were used in that right. time period. And so, uh, so the idea of bringing those two together was, was, was kind of fun to, to yeah. finally kind of have that off my to-do. Well, and the, the blue in that, you know, just reminds me of Charge and the, and the windows that you showed earlier on the medieval windows, especially. Um, so I can see where, you know, you've, you've brought together the modern design and then the colors from the, the, old, the older windows. Yeah, yeah. And to see the bubbles in the glass and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Really yeah, really which speaks to the material, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Are there any other questions? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, how do you select the street artists in particular? Um, well, that's a good question. We're, we're um, kind of always looking for artists. So um, it's, I, I guess, a two-way street. <laughs> you know, the, the artists, uh, you know, we may reach out to them and say, hey, would you, you know, your, it looks like your work would would be interested in glass, would you come and, you know, tour the studio? And then, um, you know, you can tell almost immediately the response of an artist to glass. Like you can see the wheels turning, you know, <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> right, would you say, Ruth? That's- Yes, I absolutely yeah. agree. And- um, There's a visceral response or, and if, there, yeah. if it isn't there, it's, you know. Exactly, it, it yeah. in a very short amount of time, you can tell if somebody's interested and, and, and you know, um, and sometimes we meet people and we don't see them for years, you know, and then they come back and say, hey, I've, I've finally got this project I want to do. Um, David Flores, for example, um, his, if you know his work, his, his very kind of linear and almost kind of like, the, he always has these black lines going through his work. And so the stained glass was something that he had always thought about anyway. And so um, he used his show at Sullivan Goss to kind of um, work that in. And uh, he did not sell the piece. He still keeps it in his studio. So he loved the piece so much that he, he doesn't want to sell it. And so he keeps it in his studio. And, and um, so, um, so it's, it's a little bit of both. You know, sometimes artists finds us, sometimes we find them. Um, but the idea being that, um, you know, it's, we're, we're usually looking at painters. Uh, we're usually looking at people, you know, obviously you want to work in two dimensional um, work and, uh, and, you know, usually what I tell artists is that, uh, and kind of the theme of tonight is that you have to work with the material, right? You have to let the material drive what it does. You don't want to just make one of your paintings into a, into a window. There's, there's some kind of translation there that, uh, you know, we try to help bring out uh, of the artist and the artist, what I like about it is that the artist pushes us, you know, to think about things and do things that we may not have thought of. And um, so that kind of tension and that um, kind of mutual respect, I think creates a lot of interesting ideas and, and thoughts that, you know, um, when I really started thinking my, my father died rather suddenly and, you know, the studio kind of fell in my hands and I kind of had to make a decision of deciding, well, you know, just hunker down and kind of do projects that come and, and you know, work on the, um, you know, the legacy that has been left or, you know, 
push this thing, you know, and I, and I think to me, it wasn't really a choice. It was something that just came naturally to me that I wanted to invite artists to bring them into the studio to really think about things differently, to, to get as big as we could and um, see what happens. And so, um, so that relationship I think has been really valuable um, of, of getting that creative energy into the studio. Sorry, that I was, was just going to be, I was just going to use that word. That word energy keeps coming to mind. It just seems, yeah. the, the work seems so dynamic. Um, and I, I mean, I can imagine it must be exciting, you know, to be doing these projects and working with these people and, you know, having all this um, kind of cross fertilization of ideas and, and talents and, and energies. And it, it seems like a very exciting thing. I love it. It's like every day, you know, opening the kiln is like Christmas, you know, you open yeah. the kilns up and they're like, okay, did it work? You know, is it, <laughs> and you learn something on every project. And so, I mean, that's the good and the bad and that, um, you know, from a business perspective, it's maybe not the best thing, but in terms of an artistic and creative one, it's, it's totally worth it. And so yeah. finding well, that. Well, it's that idea too, that hand, head and heart that you started yeah. with, you know, that Ruskin idea. I mean, you get to engage all of those things in your work. I mean, what a great way to spend your life. <laughs> um, I really wanted to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Carol, is I, that you? It's Carol. It's Carol. Hi, Carol. And I just keep, well, it, it just relates to what you said. I've been wanting to ask it all evening. When you have something as specific, say, as the, um, the eye of the lion, the eye of the lion, and of course the eyes of Jesus, but it, it, it looks so perfect as the artist planned it. Well, when you put it in the kiln and like the next morning, like you just said, well, did it work out all right? Do you do the eye or something that the iris and the pupil, do you do it last? So it's, it's sort of already harder. How do you keep it from just all running together? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's, yeah. and that's again, where the leading comes in, right? So if we're building a piece, like all those panels were four by five feet. And so, uh, if we don't lead them, if it's just one piece, you know, the, 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 the larger the piece, the more exponential, exponentially difficult it becomes because it's like, I, I think of it as like being on a tightrope without a net, right, to a certain extent. But um, the, and the process of fusing is very different. You know, stained glass is a thousand years old, right? And so there's not much has changed over time. And so you, you kind of go from A to Z the process and it's all about the skill level and how well you do something obviously the design at the beginning with fused glass so say the eye for example carol is we're doing a lot of samples beforehand so a lot of a lot of research and development goes into each project before you actually go into the final pro uh, product and so we'll have looked at uh, a lot of uh, pieces before we get to, the, to certain things that we feel like what we need to really look a particular way. Um, and so that knowledge is, 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 is built as we do more and more projects um, uh, to, to, to get the effect that we're going for. And so even though we pretty much know what it's gonna look like, we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like. So there is some of that. Um, the nice thing about tying in the traditional painting with the, with the process is that, as I showed you, the base is painted with the traditional glass. We cover it with the fused glass. And then if it's not kind of exactly the way we want it, we can go back in and paint, or we can go back in and, and add more glass. You know, um, so mm -hmm. there is a little mm -hmm. bit of uh, mm -hmm. uh, development through that that you can, mm -hmm. you can work through. And so, um, you yeah, know, but there, there's constantly surprises, and most of them are happy surprises as we go, as we go building the windows. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, Kara. Well, I think we'll probably start to wrap up then, um, if, unless there's a, another pressing question anyone has. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Thank you, especially David, for giving us all this presentation, for sharing these images. Um, for teaching us an awful lot. I know that I learned a lot too. Um, so thank you so much for all of that. You're here. You're um, here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And there's, a, you, there's a few announcements I wanted to, do you have any, any last words from you too, David, before I start with these announcements? I'm all talked out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so a few, few closing announcements from the, the Ruskin Art Club. 
Um, I did want to let you know that we recorded this presentation tonight. We will be posting it at the Ruskin Art Club website, so you can go back um, to refer to it if you'd like to. If there's someone you know who missed it, you can pass it on that information oh. on to them as well. Um, yeah. Professor Jim Spate's lectures on misunderstood elements in Ruskin's biography will also be up on our website as well. And there's also Jim's blog, www.yruskin.online. They'll be posted there. I think that's right, Gabriel, as well. Okay. Um, this coming Saturday, October 10th, we'll be screening um, BTHE award-winning documentary, The Biggest Little Farm, on the remarkable ecological vision behind the Apricot Lane Farm in Moore Park, California. Filmmaker and farmer John Chester will answer questions on site after the screening. This is Saturday, October 10th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. is the screening, and from 3.30 to 4.30, there's a Q&A with John Chester. Are you recording that? Are we recording that, Gabriel? Well, it's just I can't, th those exact hours, I have a tech rehearsal. Yeah, I think so anything, I, I'm pretty sure that anything we're doing on Zoom will be recorded and posted at the, at the website. That's, that's correct. That's yeah. Correct. Um, Thursday, October 29th at 5 p.m., Dr. Janet Bubar-Rich will give a presentation on the impact of pre-Raphaelites Rossetti and Morris on the figure of Guinevere in the Arthurian myth cycle. Uh, more information will be forthcoming about that, and I'm sure you can check the website for further information about that event. Um, it's also worth noting that on all the five Saturdays of October, the Roycroft community in East Aurora, New York, with the Guild of St. George and the Ruskin Society of North America, is presenting a virtual conference on Ruskin Roycroft and the arts and crafts movement. And that website is www.roycroftcampuscore.com, and you can find more information there as well. And the last um, announcement I wanted to leave you with is that um, you can donate to the Ruskin Art Club at our website. And to let you know that donations help to continue with programming events like the one we held tonight and the ones that I've just mentioned in the announcements. Um, please visit the membership page at the website as well and consider becoming a member of the Ruskin Art Club. Information and applications are available at the site. And that's the end of my announcements. And just thank you again to everyone for being here. And um, I hope to see you at future Ruskin Art Club events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.